Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Fleming Bruce. I'm with Camelot Excalibur Trust, and we do um, programming like this oh. that looks at current events and issues that will take us through the election year. So I'm I'm here from South Carolina. Um, not too long ago, we had an opportunity to talk to um, a good number of the historians. I think we had nine of them on board who talked with us about their amicus brief with Trump versus Anderson. So um, that is online. You can uh, check that out on my site. Today, we have the momentous decision by SCOTUS. And so we've been fortunate enough to um, get four of our scholars back to give us their reaction um, to the decision. Um, it was a unanimous decision where SCOTUS decided um, to overturn the Colorado decision. Um, and we want to hear from each of you on that. We, again, thank you so much for giving us your time. I think we're gonna be, we're, we're very fortunate because you are gonna be snatched up by a whole lot of other media today. Uh, so we thank you and let's start, um, let's start with Alan. All right, I'll give you the bad, the good and the ugly. The bad of course was the Supreme Court aired badly based on our amicus brief and our review of history in claiming that a candidate for federal office can only be disqualified by an act of Congress. In fact, as we decisively proved, not a single one of the thousands of ex-Confederates who were disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment were disqualified under an act of Congress. They were all automatically disqualified, as Jefferson Davis himself recognized in his trial, and the two judges in the trial agreed. The very moment the 14th Amendment was ratified, covered ex-Confederates were disqualified. The only act of Congress was to give amnesty to former Confederates who had previously been disqualified. So that said, let me get to the good, because there is some good here. Number one, consistent with our brief, the Supreme Court did not buy into Trump's argument that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment excluded the president. It did not so rule. It only said a president can only be excluded or disqualified by an act of Congress. Secondly, the Supreme Court, consistent with our brief, did not buy into the argument that Section 3 only applied to ex-Confederates. Clearly, in its ruling, it indicated that it applies indefinitely to future insurrectionists. So these positive aspects, the good, puts on warning future insurrectionists that you will not necessarily get away scot-free. You can be disqualified by the states if you try to run for a state office and you can be disqualified to run for a federal office by an act of Congress. Here's the ugly, though. As the four women justices, interestingly, as a block, pointed out, the five male justices went too far in stating that an own, even if you buy all their reasoning, that only an act of Congress could disqualify a federal candidate. Clearly, the Supreme Court could disqualify them. Supreme Court ruling applies to all the states. So this idea that unless you had an act of Congress, you'd have all these patchwork decisions by the state clearly does not apply to a decision by the Supreme Court. As Amy Comey Barrett indicated, they just went too far and unnecessarily too far. But it's just five justices and a future ruling of the Supreme Court could well find something that is quite different. So insurrectionists, you actually, even in this very friendly Supreme Court, as friendly a court as you're going to get, are on notice that you're not necessarily going to get away with your actions. That's a good point. Good, succinct comments. Thank you so much. Um, Manisha, why don't you jump in here? 
Yes, uh, I just read the entire decision and um, the concurring uh, decisions by the, the women justices. As Alan says, it's interesting that the women uh, had those points to make. Um, I am um, a, a little more pessimistic than Alan. Uh, I think um, uh, the conservative majority in the Supreme Court, they ruled by five to four that uh, you know, the in the majority decision that Congress has to uh, enforce the disqualification and that states don't uh, uh, have the right to do that. Firstly, let me congratulate the conservatives for giving up on their deep respect for states' rights that they have always, <laughs> uh, they have always shown in all their decisions. But strangely enough, in this a particular decision, they uphold federal and national authority of the 14th Amendment. So quite out of character. Um, and as Alan put it, you know, this is a self-executing clause. It doesn't require an act of Congress uh, to actually enforce it, nor does it require the state to enforce it. So the Colorado State Supreme Court was not enforcing the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment the disqualification they were simply upholding the qualification uh, the disqual the constitution and the disqualification of the 14th amendment so i wonder what the supreme court wants to say here that states have no right to uphold and interpret the constitution at all that there always has to be enabling legislation i think i'm going to run for the presidency and wait for congress to pass a law saying that i can't run for it because you know, uh, I'm not born in the United States. So I, I thought that was um, a very bizarre argument to make for people who are originalists and states' rights people. But I was also disappointed with the liberal justices. Um, they seem to counterintuitively understand that this decision will seriously, as they conclude, uh, you know, that, it can, that, that the majority decision will probably prevent uh, any person evoking Section 3 that could bar an oath-breaking insurrectionist in their terms from becoming precedent. Mm -hmm. They seem to claim that, um, as Alan also pointed out, that the Supreme Court was going too far, but that they had concurred with the decision because they could not allow Colorado to disqualify Trump because it would create what they call this chaotic state-by-state -state patchwork. What they don't seem to understand is that if the Supreme Court had rendered a decision disqualifying Trump, that would have had a national effect. It would not have meant that each state gets to decide. The decision as it stands now has a national effect that Trump, in fact, cannot be barred from any state's ballot. Mm -hmm. So I um, was disappointed in, in their concurrence, uh, but Quite clearly, they um, were, uh, the three liberal justices uh, were a little nervous that this kind of blanket majority decision saying that Congress must pass enabling legislation to enforce the Constitution, which is a bizarre idea. Uh, I'm sure most professors of constitutional law would say that, um, that that would have a bad effect for the future of the American Republic. Uh, Amy Comey Barrett and her, she's the only one I think who who stuck by her state's rights principles because she felt that federal legislation is not should not be the way in which Section 3 can be exclusively enforced. But it was a very short opinion where she basically said that she was just happy it was settled, that this political um, issue is settled and that, you know, we don't have to go down that road. I, I really think that this lives up to the Supreme Court's historic role since Reconstruction, uh, the Reconstruction era Supreme Court, of uh, whittling away federal civil rights laws and constitutional amendments. Um, you know, that's we always talk about racist terror and the overthrow of Reconstruction, but the Reconstruction era Supreme Court played a crucial role in, in um, letting racist terror prevail in the South and eventually ending with Plessy versus Ferguson that gave the green light uh, to Jim Crow and the disfranchisement mm -hmm. of black men. So the Supreme Court seems to be acting in form. And even then Republican appointed judges went along with many of those decisions. Um, and I am, I, I, I don't think it's a good day for the court. It's, uh, you know, its popularity is not particularly high. It's not going to be any higher. But I do think 
uh, the 14th Amendment will continue to be a sleeping giant in our constitution with its both its protections, but also a, the punitive sections of it that would prevent an overthrow of democracy or democratic governance not being implemented. Um, and in that sense, um, I am very, uh, and I'm glad, yes, I'm glad that they did not make any ruling whether Trump was guilty of insurrection or not. Uh, they stayed away from that uh, on purpose, I think. Uh, but it seems to me that they fast track uh, all the decisions and all the cases that lets Trump off the hook and they're slow peddling all the decisions, including the immunity case um, that, that doesn't let Trump off the hook. And this is primary season and I think it's going to have an effect politically uh, on, on, you know, Trump is going to seal the deal with the Republicans with this decision. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Brooks, I'm going to you next. Yeah, we need to hear you. There you go. Okay, I'm not as disappointed with this decision as, as uh, Nisha is. Um, I, I think, in fact, it illuminates certain ways in which Trump is still vulnerable and can be disqualified from office. Uh, I think that uh, the uh, dissent um, just showed that those justices in the interest of harmony muted uh, some of the criticisms they could have made, though they are there, uh, especially the reliance on Griffin's case, uh, which is now a case that everyone has to look for that uh, once upon a time <laughs> you couldn't find in most of the histories of the Supreme Court during the Reconstruction period. I do think this is pretty much like the Supreme Court during the Reconstruction period, during the Johnson presidency and early Grant presidency, trying it best to dance away from certain issues because its credibility is at stake. Um, you can see this opinion, which I found amazing. If, if you took a basic American constitutional law class, you'd see some old friends, Marbury versus Madison's there, McCulloch versus Maryland is there, a, a new a uh, case that we've all heard about, the Dobbs case is there, and in fact, it's the lead part of the uh, dissent from the three uh, Democratic uh, justices. Um, I really don't make much of uh, Justice Isbard's uh, uh, concurrence. Uh, it's, she might as well just say, can't we all get along? Um, and, and that seemed to me to be about uh, it. It seemed to be more of a uh, a political, not a partisan statement, but a political statement as opposed to a, a legal analysis. And maybe that's all she could do. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, I think that the um, five justices who agreed and, and are uh, uh, formed that majority opinion, they have pointed some uh, routes that may be pursued. Uh, I'm sure Jack Smith read this uh, rather carefully this morning. I'm sure other uh, attorney uh, generals and district attorneys have read this uh, carefully. Uh, it does mention the uh, Second Confiscation Act uh, method of uh, disqualifying Trump from office. So there are ways to disqualify Trump from office. The longer political uh, uh, challenge posed by this opinion, however, is that the court even as it may have overreached in its majority uh, opinion on what was going on, just raising the question, just like Dred Scott, so what? That, that question was not before the court. Therefore, what they say is over dictum. It's nothing else. Um, it kicks the can down the road to the fall election. Uh, people should remember that Congress uh, is seated uh, after those elections. Uh, much earlier, and that they can go ahead and vote prior to the counting of the Electoral College. Uh, and this will put a lot of Republicans in a very interesting position, um, especially given the outcome of whatever the outcome is of that election. If Trump is a winner, uh, are you going to support this insurrectionist who you say you don't want anything to do with? Well, if you're in Congress, you have a chance to do that before the electoral votes are counted. Uh, so uh, the crisis persists. Uh, and anyone who sees this as a definitive ruling that settles everything is sorely mistaken. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. 
Um, Vernon, I, I know that this is the second time that, that uh, you and I have done these um, programs around historians doing amicus briefs, uh, just the, the two of us. Um, and so I'm interested in how your perspective has amplified about the importance of historians weighing in uh, in amicus brief um, for these SCOTUS cases. It certainly got a lot more press um, this time, uh, national and international press. So um, what are the things that, that come to mind for you in terms of why it's important for historians and scholars to continue to, um, to weigh in uh, with these amicus briefs? Well, this is the third time actually that we've done it, the second time on this. But uh, I first want to say how impressed I am with my colleagues uh, and their analysis. And secondly, how impressed I am with the brief that we did. Mm -hmm. um, now, when we did this brief, maybe some did, but I suspect most were like me. We did not expect that the Supreme Court would rule otherwise. Right. <laughs> the reason I wanted to be a part of this, and I think it's very important, the Supreme Court going back to Dred Scott has too often created a false history in a time when Donald Trump sort of uh, created this idea of alternative facts. The Supreme Court had done that before, and they have continued to do it. The, the most egregious, as mentioned earlier, of course, is the overturning of Dobbs. But, uh, a row, excuse me, with Dobbs. But this is why we did it. And of course, I'm disappointed. It could have been worse, uh, as as I think Brooks makes very clear, and Alan, I'm closer to Manissa on being disappointed in what they have done, particularly some of the people I have such respect for on that court. Because if you believe that precedent is important, as so many of those justices claim this is their lifeblood of how they have ruled, if you believe that intent is central to how you rule, whether you're a textualist or an originalist, there is no doubt if you read our brief then and you believe in history, that it's very clear what the outcome should be. This is self-executing. I'm very happy that they did not say that the president is excluded, which is what the former president, Donald Trump, argued. But it is disappointing if history matters. At least, it seems to me, there is an alternative record, and we have to keep doing that. I would push a little bit further, because this is a voting rights case, ultimately. Go beyond Plessy v. Ferguson, and I would say it was the 1898 Mississippi uh, case, which said that, in fact, if the Constitution uses neutral sound and language, even though they knew what the intent of it was, they bragged about it, then it was okay to disfranchise, to follow up particularly on what Brooks and Manisha have said. This fits so incredibly the pattern of reconstruction and justice deferred. Armand Durfner argued that with reconstruction, those the, the United States put together a wall of protection legally. And secondly, the other was federal enforcement of the laws. And what you have seen again and again and again, as was with Reconstruction, it's not all at one time, but taking away one of those blocks out of the wall. Mm -hmm. And it happened. So it's not like all of a sudden Reconstruction ended. They undermined it through the courts so that in the last Reconstruction, unless you consider the Civil Rights Mass Movement the second Reconstruction, but the original Reconstruction, the court actually rules it's okay to kill black voters uh, as long as it's not the state doing it. It has to be tried in the state again. So if people like states' rights, you can see why some of these people may say this is pretty good. I find it incredibly disappointing. Uh, I know of at least one justice who read our brief, and I understand the need for harmony, particularly after the egregious 
Bush v. Gore decision that was so political. But I still think we're in dangerous, overall, very dangerous territory, not just about elections and voting rights, but what is democracy? How do you find democracy if people cannot follow the Constitution and the rule of law? It's exactly where Lincoln came out ultimately his whole life, going back to the Lyceum speech, that you have to have a rule of law because on one hand, you're going to have total anarchy. And on the other hand, what one of the candidates today is bragging, that is total authoritarianship and dictatorship. So where is the court? For that matter, where is Congress, as Alan has suggested, to stand up for democracy itself? This court case was about democracy. And though we can look at some things and say they are good, Overall, I think it's like it's exactly what people said during Reconstruction. Well, it still leaves this. It still leaves that. It's going to be okay, but it's another undermining of the basis of the rule of law and undermining what those of us who believe in democracy thinks is essential to have for a democratic society. Yes, I, Alan. Yeah. Let me make it clear. I agree with everything that Brooks Manisha and Vernon have said, and my commentary was not meant to suggest any disagreement. Why did I say what I said? A simple reason. I did not want future insurrectionists to believe that this decision necessarily lets them off the hook and that they could do what the insurrectionists did after 2020 and presume that they're going to get away scot free with that. And that doesn't just apply to Donald Trump, who you know is going to engage in insurrection if he loses the 2024 election. But that should apply to everyone who joined that. And by the way, that should have applied after 2020 to most Republicans in Congress who joined and participated the insurrection. They might not have led it, but they were implicated in it. So while I agree with all of the brilliant comments here, I am just issuing a warning to all of you who think that you could replicate what happened after 2020 and simply get away with it because of this decision. That is not true. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, any other comments that you all want to share? We. We're not going to be here the whole hour because we know everybody has to break away for other meetings. Yeah, I've got to but go I want to make meetings. sure that uh, everybody has their say. Yeah, I would agree with Alan that there are a lot of silver linings in this decision, but I was hoping that the Supreme Court could indeed once in its history <laughs> actually enforce some of the provisions of the 14th Amendment, including barring states who indulge in water suppression uh, or not barring, but penalizing them with con uh, in reducing their congressional rep uh, representation if they indulge in water suppression. That is something that should have happened in the Jim Crow era and certainly after Williams versus Mississippi that uh, Vernon referred to, that case in 1898, and it didn't. Um, my fear with the Supreme Court is that it is so politicized, right? The liberal judges in their concurring opinion simply said that they lack judicial restraint. I think that's a polite way of saying that they have become so politicized. Uh, and we've seen this going right back to Bush v. Gore, but also Heller uh, completely misinterpreting the Second Amendment, um, but also citizens allowing dark money to flood our uh, election process. Um, also, Shelby versus Holder gutting the Voting Rights Act, the second reconstruction. They're walking back from the second reconstruction. And then, of course, we have the Dobbs decision. So this is a pattern. And it, it does remind me a lot of the Supreme Court in the reconstruction era that goes from Crookshank to Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, to civil rights cases, Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, and then the Williams case, they, you know, you can literally name these very political decisions that they have made that have seriously impacted the rights of uh, Americans. And many of these rights, including the right to privacy in Roe v. Wade, come from the 14th Amendment and its, its egalitarian language. 
So I think this project of emasculating the 14th Amendment, including its equal protection clauses and the, the parts that would safeguard our democracy. I think Vernon put it really eloquently. This is about our democracy. This is about the future of the American Republic. Um, I am hoping that all this does show, as Alan said initially in his remarks, that, that Trump is actually quite weak, even with this, uh, this hall pass that he's getting from the Supreme Court, uh, that he has all these criminal cases against him, uh, he hasn't been uh, prosecuted as yet for January 6th, but many of his followers have and are in prison for that. So, uh, you know, uh, that is that is the silver lining for me, that that maybe all these ways in which Trump is getting away with with uh, all kinds of things is, you know, at one point he, that this is going to come back and bite him. Certainly financially, he seems to be in deep water right now. Um, and, you know, him just taking over the Republican Party and maybe its scoffers also to help him out is is a problem for democracy because in a two-party system, if you have one party that is completely um, in debt to his shenanigans, uh, we can't trust them with political power anymore. I want to add with Manissa, I outlined exactly six cases from the first Reconstruction through 1898 and things actually 1898 being more than that. But I think we're getting very close with the number that we've seen come down under the Roberts court. And to me, that's very frightening. If, uh, if we see this undermining continuing again, let's just, and I think the American people are better than this. I really do. I don't believe maybe the issues aren't clear. That's the other reason that, I'm so glad that Alan said, let's do this, that we were trying to also educate the American public yes. uh, about what is going on if they really believe in democracy, to understand how the court has been manipulating. And here was, I think we did a good job on this, uh, showing how the court has misrepresented. That is, they have a predetermined, at least a group of them, a predetermined decision and then they create these false histories. And I think it's incumbent on historians, professional historians, to keep at least as much as we can, get the story out to the general public, not just among ourselves, of what is going on so they can understand the real threats. Also, I must say, I was disappointed in the liberal justice. I can understand what they were doing, but I am disappointed. Uh, that they didn't at least make something stronger that I think would have been accurately historical. Thank you so much. Brooks, you have any final thoughts? Yeah, yeah I, I think this is also something that forecasts for the future for us. Um, we've seen the court try to thread the needle in this case, which a lot of us had anticipated it would do. It will try to thread the needle once more with the presidential immunity case. So we're seeing a preview of a court that's going to agree on certain things and disagree on others. Uh, and uh, that case is just as important, frankly, as this case uh, in determining the future of uh, 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 not uh, uh, our democratic republic. The other thing is, since we're you know always hearkening back to the Civil War Reconstruction, um, this election is more interesting in that we already know what will happen if yes. Donald Trump loses. We know that there will be efforts to try to thwart the will of the people. In my home state of Arizona, there were people who wanted the electoral vote to be counted now for Donald Trump uh, to remove uh, the uh, right of popular vote, to move it back to Republican-controlled state legislatures. Uh, the, this is a, a coup under full color of law, if you will. Uh, and we can anticipate, I think, the possibility, again, of insurrectionary activity and efforts to obstruct the counting of, of the Electoral College vote and every single effort that certain people can make to thwart the exercise of people's right to vote for president. Um, this is really an important year in American history. When I was growing up, I was the first year where I knew history was taking place was 1968. I knew that things were happening that year. The assassinations of King and Robert Kennedy, 
uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, the summer, uh, spring of 1968 in France, you knew what was going on. This is one of those years. Yes. Uh, and historians have a role to play in at least keeping the narrative clean and honest and faithful to the historical record. I'd like to make one final comment. One final comment, yes, sir. Manisha had to say about this is a very low bar in terms of letting Trump off the hook. All right, he'll be on the ballot, okay. But as Manisha points out, he is facing serious criminal charges. The first uh, major party presidential candidate to face any criminal charges, much less 91 felony counts. And for some reason, the American people don't seem to be focused on what's happening in just three weeks from now. Trump is going on trial in New York for 30 plus felonies. Unfortunately, the media has totally misrepresented the import of this trial. They've called it the hush money trial. It is not a hush money trial. Donald Trump is not on trial for paying hush money. That's not illegal. It's an election fraud charge and thus consistent with the charges being brought by the special counsel on January 6th and by the Fulton County DA in Georgia. What Trump is being charged with is defrauding the American people by paying hush money to this porn star to forestall her narrative coming out before the election and then to deceive the American people by making it believe it was a business expense. And we have the checks signed by Donald Trump to prove that. If this was anyone but Donald Trump, this would be considered the trial of the century, a presidential candidate, former president, on trial for election fraud. And if convicted, it would be considered utterly disqualifying. It's really important that this trial be properly understood and properly framed and not diminish the way the mainstream media has done so far. Well, thank you. Thank you, each one of you, for making time to uh, give your response today to SCOTUS's uh, decision on Trump versus Anderson. So, Bernard Burton, Alan Lickman, Brooks Simpson, and Manisha Sinha, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for doing the work of historians in this space of legal decision-making and an electoral year. Vernon, should we uh, do another amicus for the immunity case? Yeah, I'm wondering if we shouldn't, but boy, it's a lot of work. That's what we didn't say, but what a great group. I just want to say what an honor it was for me to work with this group of people and the other who signed on. It, it really shows that people care and that we believe that history matters. It matters. And not, it's just not as... The if English it's not history, it's going to be alternative that history. All, yes, right. That that you can make things up. Yep. That they're all equal. There is evidence. And I cannot help but say how disappointed I am that they did not look at the evidence itself. But well, I think surprising. there was a comment uh, that I saw in, um, in Brooks' uh, Twitter feed about historical scholars and legal scholars working together. All right. Um, Thank you all. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so Alan, much. Buddy. And we'll have yeah. the links to all this. This will be on our page. We'll have the links to everything soon. Thank you again. Right. Send it to Bye -bye. us when it's time. And we appreciate sure it. Will. Thank you for getting this story out, uh, Catherine. Appreciate it. Very important. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Catherine. you very much. Good luck on CNN and MSNBC today, guys.